Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa. And on today's episode, I'm super excited to have with us in studio, Bethany Lucas, who is a licensed real estate agent, who is going to be answering your questions on the things you need to look for when it comes time to buying your new homestead. That's what's coming up on today's episode. Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead. Come along with us on our journey from a small suburban homestead lifestyle to our new lifestyle homesteading in the rural countryside of Southern Arizona. We'll share with you our tips, tricks, successes, and failures from both our past suburban lifestyle to our new rural lifestyle, all on the Two Acre Homestead. Bethany, I am super excited to have you in studio today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into real estate? Yeah, so I'm a licensed real estate in uh, Southern Arizona. Uh, I've been in business for many years and I love working with people. I love, so I used to be a bartender for 14 years. So connection with people has always been something that's special and dear to my heart. So instead of, you know, selling a beer, why not sell houses and land, right? And it's just been a joy to help people find their future home, help them in situations, and it's just been uh, a blessing for sure. Well, awesome. And full disclosure to the listeners, I have worked with Bethany now. She is our real estate agent, actually. And I can Mm -hmm. attest to, yes. (laughs) And I can attest to the fact that the girl knows her stuff. So I am happy to have you in studio with us because I think all of our listeners can benefit from your knowledge. So well, Bethany, having me. It's exciting. (laughs) No problem. Well, I've got a series of questions for you. Some are from our listeners And some are things that I know um, people have wondered about here in the homesteading community. So first out the gate, you know, a lot of people are looking to get out of the city and they're interested in buying land. Land, I I can speak from a professional perspective. Land is a very tricky thing. Very. Um, Yeah, it's very tricky. There's a lot of things that you got to think about, a lot of a lot of uh, things people don't know about before they haul off and buy a plot of land. And in your professional opinion, what are some of the major things that you can think of that a person would need to be aware of prior to purchasing a parcel of land, whether they're buying raw land, an improved land or improved land? So there are a lot of things to actually take into consideration Zoning and land regulations. Uh, It's important to understand the zoning and land use of the regulations in the area where the land is located. Uh, This will help you determine what types of structures and activities are allowed on the property and where there are restrictions or limitations that could impact your plans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Access to utilities and certain services. You should consider the accessibility to the land including whether there are roads or infrastructures that allow you to get to the property. That's a big thing that I've I've dealt with in my personal career. Uh, Whether there are easements or right away that can impact the use of the land. You should also consider the availability of uh, utilities, such as water, sewer, electricity, uh, even, you know, internet and phone services. Another thing, uh, environmental factors, right? So you should consider uh, the features of the land, including the topography. Topography, I can never say that word right. Uh, But the elevation of the land. So the dips, the hills, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Soil type, that's very important for homesteads uh, and vegetation, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also consider potential environmental issues. So flood zones are huge, right? Wetlands and endangered species that people just don't think about, right? And then, of course, affordability. 
Mm-hmm. You should consider the cost of the land, whether it fits in your budget. And then future development. This is huge because a lot of times there's state land around, right? So you should consider the potential of the future development in that area, including any planned or proposed infrastructure projects, zoning changes, other factors that could impact the value and the use of the land. You know, I, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you said about, uh, you made the comment about state land, mm-hmm. um, because oftentimes people will will try to market a parcel of, of land and they'll say, you know, it, it, it this parcel of land um, is right next to a BLM, a Bureau of Land Management. So, you know, there's never going to be anything there. And every time I I hear or see that, I always think, don't fall for it because because of the fact that it's owned by the government, Mm -hmm. they can sell it at any given time. And you obviously won't have any say so on the use of that land. So just because something is next to a BLM does not necessarily mean that that is the right thing for you. And as a realtor, I can only do my due diligence for you, right? I can only be like, this is what they're saying. This is what we're seeing. But you never know 10 years from now how that's going to change. And so it's always good to keep your eyes open. And just uh, if you see something happening, get ready for the future. But for the, I mean, if you love the land, you know, get it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll be good for a while, but just be, have your eyes open. Right. Be aware of it. Yeah. Thank you. And so I know there's a hot topic here in Southern Arizona and it is, I mean, this is a hot topic. Um, When let's circle back around to rights, mineral rights, water rights. That's a hot topic here because Mm -hmm. there's a town in Southern Arizona that just voted to give up its rights uh, to water rights for everybody in that town. Um, whether you're on a well or not, and that is water rights. What is the significance? What do we need to be aware of when we're dealing with water rights? So in Arizona, the right to drill a well and use groundwater is regulated by uh, Arizona Department of Water Resources. So generally, anyone who owns the land in Arizona has the right to drill a well and use the groundwater for you know, household purposes, such as drinking, cooking, sanitation. Mm -hmm. And even though we are assured by city officials, it is important to recognize that water is a finite resource. So Mm -hmm. as a result, uh, it is essential to use the water wisely and to conserve it when, you know, possible. So I've actually heard a few things, you know, Tucson is developing so quickly. Right. And for example, we have Marana, who has doubled in size. So I'm seeing a lot of people with the water issues coming from out of state. They're curious about all the water. And as of right now, um, we're not seeing any limitations in mainly Tucson. Right. Outsources a little bit, like you were saying. Um, Mm -hmm. But from what I've seen, I do see future in from hearsay right so i'm hearing that people are saying that grass for example is that a necessity do we need to be watering the grass or is it more essential to uh keep that you know for the the household stuff the sanitation the you know planting your vegetables rather than just having grass in the front yard right so we're seeing limitations in that aspect but we haven't seen anything drastic quite yet Okay. So when a person is looking at land and they're looking at buying a parcel of land, do they want to ensure that they do have the water rights? Is that is that something that you would recommend or not? <laughs> so, yes, of course, I'm going to ask, you know, what's important to you? What are you going to be using, you know, that land for? So if they're using it for a homestead, for example, I suggest getting irrigation. So it's timed, right? Mm -hmm. I suggest having something where you know where the water is going to be used for rather than Mm -hmm. just wasting it. So there's other things that I've noticed too. A lot of people are doing the rainwater um, 
uh, collecting the rainwater, right? I think that's genius. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that just having that extra water in case something does happen, you know, it's really hot out and you already have that stored rainwater, being able to use that as a resource rather than, you know, pumping from your well or anything like that. I think that would be beneficial because uh, we are in a desert. Like a lot of things are going to need water. So if you can use any other resource rather than, you know, using up your well or city water, whatever you're going to be using, I think that would be ideal. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking to build a homestead from the ground up? Or maybe you're looking to build an off-grid dream home, a vacation home, or maybe just a piece of land to call your own. Visit yourcheapland.com to buy rural land in the wide open spaces of Southwestern United States. When you visit yourcheapland.com, they're here to help you. And with their help, you can do this. You can take your dream of owning land and make it a reality. Most down payments are only $294, including the document fee. Remember, everyone qualifies for financing at yourcheapland.com. Head on over to yourcheapland.com and start making those dreams come true. And now, back to our podcast. Sounds good. So when it comes to Another question here, and this actually comes from a listener who wanted to know when it comes to people wanting to buy not just land, but they want to build a property on it. There's a lot of things. I, I know there's a lot of things that a person needs to think about when it comes to building, but are there any tips that you can provide as far as what we should be thinking about when it comes to building permits? right to build, types of building, um, zoning laws. What are those things from a real estate agent perspective? What are what are those things that you would recommend? I love new home builds. I don't know what it is about it. Just seeing something being built in front of you and just seeing the progress is just so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. But things that I would definitely look into is checking the local zoning and building codes. Uh, before you even begin any construction, it's important to check your local zoning and building authorities to determine whether there's any zoning restrictions or building codes that you need to comply with. Uh, this may include restrictions on the size or height of the building that you are planning to build, setbacks from the property lines and other requirements. Uh, other things, obtain necessary permits. Uh, you'll need, you'll likely need to obtain permits from your local building department before you can be begin the construction. These permits may include, uh, you know, the building permits, electrical permits, plumbing, and others, depending on the scope of the project that you're planning on building. You're also going to check where you want the right to build. It is important to verify that you have the legal right to build on that property. Uh, this may include checking for easements or restrictions on the property, such as, such as converse, conversion easements, deed restrictions, and CCNRs. Uh, CCNRs are kind of like an HOA, Covenants, Conditions, Restrictions. So if you have that, I would definitely check that out. Uh, the title company will take care of that for you and give you all that information. It's also important to ensure that your property is zoned for the type of construction you're planning. So, for example, I had a client that wanted to put a shop on their land and it was to do it for, you know, as a work condition. And we had to find specific zoning to put that, you know, garage in that area because a lot of times that's not allowed in certain zonings. Uh, you also want to consider hiring a contractor. Unless you have con experience in uh, construction, if you do, good for you. It, a lot of people don't. It's a good idea to hire a licensed and insured contractor to really oversee your project. A uh, contractor can help obtain the necessary permits for you. 
uh, ensure that the constru construction meets the local building codes and provide valuable guidance throughout the entire construction process. This is huge. So kind of like a realtor just takes, you know, the heavy weight off your shoulders and they take care of it for you. Uh, plan ahead the utilities as well. So when you are looking for the land, plan on uh, when you're doing your construction project, uh, consider, you know, utilities such as the water, the electricity, and the sewer. Uh, if it doesn't have it, you're going to have to put that in. That's a highly big cost. I always recommend, you know, definitely check to see at least if there's electric, you know, near the road. Um, you want to make sure you obtain permits or make arrangements with that local utility company to ensure that you do have access to those services. Okay. And when it, I mean, heaven forbid you have to sell your property, um, but that happens. Um, mm -hmm. If a person has all bought all the time, when a, when a person has bought a plot of land, um, what are some of the things that they can do to improve or add value to either the land or if they bought, we're, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but even if they bought a house with acreage, what are the things that they can do to improve their land um, to add value to it for resellable? So, for example, real estate agents always say location, location, location. Right. Yep. So one do. of the most important <laughs> factors when it comes to the value, yeah, when it comes to the value of the property is the location. Uh, a homestead that is lo located more in a desirable area, such as good schools, uh, shopping, uh, or any other amenities, will generally be, bring a lot more value when it's located in a less desirable area, uh, in an extremely rural area. Right. So okay. land and property size is also a big factor. The size of the property as well as, as structures on it can also impact its value. Uh, homesteads with larger amounts of land are more, and more square footage in a house or additional buildings can command a higher price than smaller properties, of course. Mm -hmm. And then features and amenities. So special features and amenities on the property can add a lot of value, such as a pool, if they already have a barn on there, uh, outbuildings, uh, fencing, solar, uh, a private well, and any other, you know, irrigation or special landscaping on the property. Uh, also, wow. the condition of the property uh, mm -hmm. is a major factor in its value. A well-maintained property and updated features and appliances would generally be more of value than if it's obviously in poor condition or if it needs a lot of repairs. Uh, and then obviously access to utilities and services, the availability, availability of utilities such as the electricity, the solar, the water wells, septic, sewer, uh, access to high speed internet, <laughs> you know, That's an and other services thing. can impact the value. <laughs> yes, impact all of the homestead value, right? So those are the, the main things, but location, location, location. Words to live by, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> Thank you for that, Bethany, because, yeah, I, you know, sometimes as homesteaders, we, we have that dream of buying the older home. And, you know, an older home doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the smart way to go all the time, because there's a lot of things that you got to think about. There's a lot of renovations. Even if you're buying a rel relatively new home, you know, there still might be some reno that you want to do. But definitely with an older home, it's there's a lot of work. Thank you for that. On the subject of um, getting a, an inspection um, is it wise, do you think, to have, uh, like, when you're when you're dealing with a, 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 the purchase of a home, is it wise to have, like, maybe a contingency on the home passing an inspection? Like saying, hey, I'll buy your house, but if it doesn't pass the inspection, you know, I'm not going to buy it. How does that, how does that work? If you've never done this before, that could be really scary to a person. 100%. And that's why you have me to guide you. Uh, including a contingency on a home inspection is generally a wise decision for a homeowner, any homeowner. 
uh, whether you're purchasing an older home or the newer one. Uh, home inspection contingency allows you to have the property inspected by a professional and gives you the opinion back uh, to either back out of the home or move forward. You'll know everything about that home from top to bottom. And you can, that's why you have me to re renegotiate that issue of if we find something major, is a seller willing to take care of that issue? How much is it going to cost? And that's why I am there to guide you for sure. Um, you, in Arizona, you actually have a 10 day contingency to do all of your inspections. If at any point during that 10 days, uh, you do have to put down earnest money within 24 hours of an accepted contract, but you have those 10 days after that accepted contract to do your due diligence and get those inspections done. And in those 10 days, if let's say we find out the, the roof is falling in and the seller decides they don't want to do anything, we have those 10 days to back out and you get your all your earnest money back and we can walk away in our hands free of that home, you will have to pay for that inspection. That's the cost, you know, of doing your due diligence. But other than that, it's better than, you know, making a $300,000 commitment. I feel like there's an elephant in the room that oftentimes does not get discussed at all. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about buying and selling properties and they leave this one thing out. Can you please explain to us the importance of having a title company in your transaction, whether you're buying land, you're buying it cash, because, you know, some people buy it, they'll buy land just cash, but, um, or even if you're getting it financed, but can you please explain what a title company is, the importance of having a title company, what role do they play in this transaction, and why it's important for listeners who are thinking of buying to always have a title company involved. Uh, a title company is a crucial component of any real estate uh, transaction, whether you're buying land or house. Uh, their primary role is to ensure that the transfer of ownership of the property is legal and valid, and that the title of the property is clear of any liens, encumbrances, which is, you know, a lot of people ask, what's, what's, the, tip, what's the difference between, you know, lien and encumbrance? Lien is a legal right and, and encumbrance is a claim on the property and any other issues that would affect the ownership rights of the value of the property. Uh, for example, I'm doing a transaction right now and the title company found $80,000 worth of liens and encumbrances on this property. Wow. So that buyer, mm -hmm, which the title company will completely take care of for you, and making sure that all that is paid before you buy that house is completely free and clear. Uh, one of the key services provided by a title company is a title search. This involves con conducting a comprehensive review of the public records and any other resources to verify the seller has a legal right to sell that property and there's no outstanding liens and conferences on the property and there's no other issues that could impact the transfer of the ownership. The title company will also have issue uh, a title uh, policy, insurance policy for you that will protect you against any defects or issues that may not have been discovered during that title search. So even and after, you're completely clear. In addition to conducting a title search and issuing that title insurance, a title company can also provide a range of other services to ensure a smooth and legal valid transaction. This may include legal documents, so if people are divorcing and they want to make sure, you know, the proceeds are going to each person individually and not one, they're going to take care of those legal issues for you. Uh, coordinating with all the lenders. So they're almost like a third party making sure, you know, if you are getting financing, that everything's being taken care of accordingly and balancing all of that money. Uh, and they also make sure everything's transferred in a timely manner and ensuring that all parties are in compliance with uh, laws and the regulations. Highly recommend a title company. I wouldn't do anything without a title company. I agreed, totally agreed. Um, I do have one other question for you, Bethany, because this oftentimes yes. does happen to people in the homesteading community 
where a person will have unfortunately have passed away and somebody is coming in to buy that said property. How does that work? So as long as they are in some sort of trust or some sort of legal binding agreement with, you know, say it was their parent, as long as they are connected to that property, it's actually a really easy process. It does go through probate. And once it is brought into a uh, conservatorship, uh, I can work with that and make sure that everything is done correctly because it will be in some sort of trustee or LLC or some sort of um, way that we can make sure that everyone is protected. So, so I highly yeah. recommend getting some sort of uh, conservative conservatorship in in mind when in general uh, for example I'm I'm with my mom I have a deed to her house like I'm, I'm on her deed just in case something does happen uh, I have that ownership to take care of whatever happens hopefully she's never passing anytime soon but just in case you never know in case I thankful, you know, the next day I, I have a breath in my lungs, you know, so you just never know. Right. Right. Amen to that. So is there anything that as a buyer, a person, is there anything that they would need to be aware of when purchasing a property from somebody who is deceased? I mean, is there any red flags or anything that they would, yeah, so... or you as a, as a realtor would look for? So let's say I'm the buyer agent. I am uh, protecting my buyer and the seller has deceased. And now uh, conservatorship, the person that's taking over, say a daughter or, or a son, has no idea about the property. They're out of state. Right. Uh, seller disclosures. You don't know. So you're going to have limited value when it comes to that. Uh, they're not going to know anything about the property. So inspections are huge. The, you're going to, I'm going to let the, as a buyer agent, going to let that inspector know, we know nothing about this house. So detail is mandatory. And I'm always at those inspections as well, walking with the inspector. So if he does see something, I'm seeing it too. He's taking pictures of absolutely everything, including age of hot water heater, age of the HVAC system. Uh, when it comes to land, I mean, a lot of things are already detailed uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, the property guidelines. Uh, if you look up, you know, uh, the CRS data, you can definitely find out a lot about the land. But when it comes to a home on the land, the home, you just don't know. So it's definitely, uh, definitely check about the inspections. For example, I just want, I had some notes about that too, because it's very important to, you know, really look at the foundation of a home when you're, you know, mm. buying a home. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's any cracks in the foundation, settling, shifting. There was a seller uh, when I was buying a home uh, that didn't disclose that there was a half inch uh, crack from the ceiling to the floor. And I noticed it and commented on it and we actually got out of that deal because the foundation was basically horrible um but those are wow. things that really think it yes it was horrible uh, electrical and plumbing issues um if the inspector says you know the plumbing seems to you know this is holding water too much it's not flowing quickly I'm going to get the a plumber out there to really diagnose it is it the sewer line is it you know it I, God forbid you have uh, a sewer line back up when you first move in, right? Uh, right, that would not roof be and good. exterior. Mm -hmm. Roof and exterior. Uh, older homes may suffer from years of wear and tear. And unless you have a roofer up there, I usually get, you know, one or two roofers up there, depending, you know, the age of the home. But if there, it's an older home, I'm getting two roofers up there to give me two quotes. Because if it needs a whole new roof, guess what? That seller is either paying for it or reducing price because that's expensive cost. Um, and then, you know, asbestos and lead paint, those are issues that, you know, if you, you disturb them, 
that could be a huge issue. So it's all these things that you just don't know about a home if that person is deceased. And so it's very important that your realtor, aka me, make sure that we are definitely making sure that is um, something you won't have to worry about once you move in. I want to protect you at all costs. Because I want you to call me, you know, in a month, year, you know, two years, how much you love that home. <laughs> and if you work with Bethany, you will. Well, Bethany, this has been a very interesting and informative conversation. And I'm sure many of our listeners, they probably have many more questions than we have time for. So um, tell us where our listeners here in Southern Arizona, because you're licensed here um, in Arizona. Um, tell us where they can get in contact with you. And for those who are not in Arizona and would like to have more information, is it possible to get a referral to another licensed real estate agent through you? Absolutely. So I know emails are a huge thing now. I prefer a phone call or a text because I want to get to know you and really know your questions and talk to you, you know, either virtually too. Uh, but phone calls are my favorite. I love to, you know, just chit chat where you're from, what you're looking for, and just answer any questions, you know, uh, verbally. So I prefer a phone call. So my cell phone number is, I have it on me 24 seven. You're not going to bother me. Everyone's like, I'm so sorry for bothering you. You never bother me. If I'm busy, I will call you back when I can. But my cell phone number is 802 802- Three four five six nine five seven. I am originally from uh, New England. I have lived in all the states, so I know that area well. I originally moved here there from there to here because my brother was in the military, and the weather is gorgeous here. And I didn't want to deal with snow anymore, so that's why I'm here. So the eight zero two number you should definitely remember. Uh, but again, it's eight zero two. Three four five six nine five seven. Shoot me a text. Give me a call. I'm here for you. Thank you, Bethany, and thanks for being on our show today. And for all of the rest of Bethany's contact information, and just in case you didn't catch that phone number, I'll, we'll go ahead and put that in the show notes down below. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having us on the show today. We really appreciate you answering a lot of these questions for us. Of course, it was a pleasure. So from all of us to all of you, wherever you are in the world, stay safe out there and happy homesteading.